Greetings and welcome to Unit 6 of our unit on Ancient Rome and the origin, Origins of Christianity. This unit will be talking about Ancient Rome, which started right or the power of Ancient Rome, which started right after the fall of Ancient Greece. So while we go through this unit, make sure you have your Lecture 1 worksheet available. And if you have any questions, as usual, please let Mr. Vincent know and we'll clear those up right away for you. So let's get started. So, setting the stage, with the defeat of the Persians by Alexander and the eventual decline of the Greek civilization, power would eventually shift west towards the Italian peninsula. The Romans would build an amazing empire filled with many different cultures and help spawn a brand new religion, Christianity. So we're taking place after Alexander has conquered Persia, and after his death, obviously. We'll talk briefly about that in a minute, but main part you need to know is first, we had Greece, which is where we left off with our last unit. After the fall of Greece and the Hellenistic culture, we now see Rome starting to take a more influential role in the Mediterranean region. So, we have the origins of Rome. Legend says that twins, Romulus and Remus, were abandoned on the Tiber River and raised by a she-wolf. What's mentioned in the book, if you read it also, that Romulus and Remus were the sons of the Roman god Mars and a princess. You'll remember from Greece on how they had their ancient, or sorry, their Greek gods. Well, Rome also had their mythological gods as well. And of that, obviously, was Mars, Uranus, several others, usually related to astrological objects like planets and stuff. But these two, according to myth, were the sons of Mars. Mars supposedly left them abandoned near the Tiber River, and a she-wolf raised them, as the story goes. Later, the two boys decided to build a city. However, they couldn't agree on certain things, and eventually Romulus kills Remus, and the city of Rome is named after Romulus. Moving on. The geography. Rome was built on the seven rolling hills of the Tiber River. These are rolling hills. Agriculture is possible, obviously not as good as if it was flat land, but the, as time went on, Rome tended to rely mostly on trade and not so much agriculture uh, around the city. They would have some farming and stuff outside of the city, but the majority of it was eventually done with trade as time went on. Rome obviously is located on the Italian peninsula, which is present-day Italy, bordered by the Adriatic Sea to the east, and is near the midpoint of the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean climate, it's warm year-round, which encouraged outdoor activity. The main thing to know about the geography of the Medi of the Rome is that because it is near the center of what the Mediterranean Sea would be, this makes it a great place for trade. It's the shortest distance, or the, 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 the most central place for everybody to meet to do trade, which makes it a great location for the exchange of goods and ideas. So, let's talk a little bit about the history. The first Romans settled on the Italian peninsula around 1000 to 500 BC. Of these, the first group were the Latins. The Latins built their settlement of wooden huts. Not a lot of high technology there, but it worked. And they are considered the first Romans of the three we're going to talk about. They did help spread Latin-derived languages to the area. Even today, a lot of the words we use in the English language come from Latin words uh, that are from this particular culture. The next group of people were the Greeks. Shortly after the Hellenistic culture, the, they moved north into Italy uh, during the decline of the Hellenistic culture. Uh, they also settled in southern Italy and Sicily. They brought all of Italy, including Rome, into contact with Greek civilization. 
This included bringing them architecture, democracy, and philosophy. We can see a lot of architecture that is similar from Greece and Rome. Uh, an example is a lot of their buildings using similar types of uh, pylons that relate to each other. If you also recall, Greece a lot of the times was a democracy or certain parts of Greece, and that transferred over again into Rome, which eventually became a republic, which we'll talk about later. And the third group was the Etruscans. These guys were really skilled metal workers and native to northern Italy. They had a very strong influence on Roman civilization. A lot of stuff that they did was acclimated to the rest of Rome as it uh, evolved. They also influenced the Roman arch. If you recall from the video that we watched, the arch being the round like entryway uh, that allowed them to build their buildings or their um, other structures using arches instead of solid walls. This saved them materials, time, but was still a very strong use of the building materials. Additionally, the Etrustrians influenced Rome's lust for killing. Uh, the Etrustrians were very much into death and dying and, and battles, and this is where a lot of their love for that came from, was from this particular group of people. And here we see just a simple map of really old ancient Roman area around 270 BC, obviously. You can see some of the regions here. Originally, the Etrustrians were up here and along the coastline up there. Down to the south in orange, you see a lot of the, the Car uh, Carthaginians or pe people of Carthage, which is right here, and all the empire that Carthage owned. This will change, obviously, later on when we get to uh, some wars we'll talk about, but you kind of get the idea. All right. So, early Rome. Early, uh, early Etruscan kings and successors built temples and public centers in Rome. The forum was at the heart of the Roman political life. We'll see pictures of that in a moment, but the thing you need to consider the forum, it's kind of like a downtown area. It's where everybody would go to conduct business, to do trade or purchase items, but it was also the heart of the political life. A lot of the political buildings were down there as well, where they would have their debates and, and the government functioned. So again, I consider it kind of like a downtown area of the city. It was the main part of the city where people would go daily um, to do whatever business they needed to do. After Rome's last king was driven, driven from power in 509 BC for being too harsh, the Romans declared they would never again be ruled by a king. They realized that having a king was hard for them. They did not like having one person having all power. So instead, they established a republic, which meant public affairs. A republic is a form of government in which power rests with the citizens who have the right to vote for their leaders. However, not everybody had the right to vote. In Rome, citizenship with voting rights was granted only to free-born male citizens. Women were not allowed to vote, slaves were not allowed to vote, obviously, and in some rare cases, if Rome had conquered your territory, you might be given, you'd be given citizenship you might be given the chance to vote, but depends on the city you were in and how far away you were from the central city of Rome. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, the difference between citizen and allies. So keep that in your mind. Here's a picture or a diagram of what the Roman form once looked like. Here you've got one of the main government buildings right there. You've got this walkway or this park area here a type of mall, I guess you could call it, as well as some shops along the edges here, and obviously the front entrance to the bottom. This is what it would have looked like uh, way back in the day, about 2,000 years ago. Now, however, this is what's left of it. 
Here we still have the mall area, the public area which people are walking through. These are just tourists down here. And this here would be that main government building, we believe, that existed back then where all the debates and the decisions were made. As you can see, these were some massive buildings, and considering these were built more than 2,000 years ago without any type of machinery, this is a very impressive feat. So keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, the Romans in particular. They were amazing at architects, and they were amazing at coming up with different ways to build things despite their lack of what we would call heavy machinery today. So let's talk about the people. Rome was divided into several different, gr different groups who struggled for power. The two main groups are the Patricians, which were wealthy landowners who held most of the power, and the Plebeians, who were the common farmers, artisans, merchants, and were also the majority of the population. A third group, as the picture shows, are slaves. Slaves, obviously, were not considered citizens. They had no voting rights. They basically had no power at all. A lot of times you were born into slavery, or sometimes when Rome would conquer you and you were a soldier, they might take you in as a slave, even though you used to be a soldier. Um, but slaves, you were born into slavery usually, or you were defeated and told you had to be a slave. That was rarity, typically. Um, most of the time, when Rome would conquer a city, they would just take its people, and its people would become part of the Roman Empire. You had to be doing something really bad to be put as a slave. So it, it wasn't all that normal for a conquering uh, city to put them all in slaves. That just didn't happen. On to the government. Uh, tribunes were elected representatives who protected the rights of the plebeians from the patrician officials. Originally, they decided, or was figured out that there were a lot of rich guys, a lot of patrician officials. Sorry, there were, there were, these guys were really rich. However, it was the plebeians that there were more of, the regular everyday people, the plebeians. Because there were more plebeians than there were patricians, the patricians realized they had to give up some of their power, their governmental power, to the plebeians. And we'll see how that looks on a chart in a minute. Consults were two officials with limited power and one-year terms. One controlled the army, the other directed the government. Again, we'll see this on a chart later on. The closest relation that we can see with what a consul was is like our president. Even though our president is only one person, he, did, he has control over a lot of government functions as well as the military. Occasionally, the republic would create what's known as a dictator, where in times of crisis, the republic would appoint a leader with absolute power to make laws and control the army. Power lasted for six months. As you can see from the fact that these guys have limited amount of time that they can do their job, it was important that they got the job done in the time they had. The councils, as it says, were only elected for one year. After that one year, they could not be re-elected again until 10 years had passed. So even though they were, had a lot of power, they did not have a lot of time to use that power. So it was important for them to use it to the best of their ability for as long as they could during that year. The purpose of the dictator was in order to cut out the middleman, to get rid of some of the conversation going on between the councils and the Senate and the Tribune, and just get it done when it needs to. A lot of times during wartime, you don't have time to argue, you don't have time to discuss, a decision has to be made. So they realized that and put in this dictator position in order to accomplish that. To prevent this guy from getting too much power, though, they've restricted it by time. He can only be given power for six months. Finally, legions, just another term that we throw in there. Uh, military units made up of 5,000 soldiers. So you may have, might have heard of uh, this term before. There's a movie on it. Uh, but basically, a legion is, is just a unit made up of about 5,000 soldiers. So whenever you hear or read in our book, it talks about 
so-and-so sent 10 legions of people, you're talking about 5,000 soldiers times 10, which is obviously 50,000 soldiers in this case. So just to kind of give you an idea uh, on the math. All right, here we're talking about the Roman government itself and how it was made up uh, in a hierarchical way. If you notice, on the top, they split it up between the plebeians and the patricians. The councils, there's one of each. Because they only have one year to get the jobs done, they have to work closely together. If one of them makes a decision and the other one objects, then whatever it was doesn't happen. They both have to agree on whatever the issue is. Even though one's in control of the government, the other one's in control of the military, they do have to agree overall on what plan the other has. Underneath them, you have the senators, which were 300. There were 150 ple uh, plebeian senators and 150 patrician senators. Makes it nice and easy. And then there were also 10 tribunes as well. And these were strictly uh, plebeians. You'll notice that it's starting to lean a lot of power towards the plebeians. But if you also look, the majority of the population were plebeians. So it was decided that because of this, the plebeians would have a higher say or a bigger say in how government would function. But that doesn't exclude the, uh, the patricians since they did have a population presence as well. And finally underneath, you got the citizen assemblies. The best way to kind of talk about a citizen assembly is think of it like a, a neighborhood block watch. You've got a group of people that get together, talk about the problems and their issues, and then they take that and send it up to the ones that can't make the decisions. The tribunes and the senators, their jobs primarily were to make the laws uh, for the people to follow. If they don't know what the problems are, they can't make the laws. So these citizen assemblies, made up of uh, adult males, would get together at the forum, discuss these problem, argue these problem problems out, and come up with some sort of consensus that they can take to the tribunes and the senators for recommendation on new laws. But again, it was ultimately up to these senators and tribunes what they wanted to do uh, in regards to that. So, Roman power expands. Steadily, the Romans conquered the Italian peninsula and took over the entire peninsula. As Rome conquered lands, people were absorbed into their ever-growing territory. Some people were accepted as citizens, others simply became allies. Now we're going to pause here because the important thing to realize is that citizens had the power to vote. If you were a male, as compared to allies, the really only difference between the two is that citizens could vote and allies couldn't. Typically allies were those cities or those small groups of people that were furthest away from Rome. They didn't have a really strong idea of what was going on with Rome. They were loosely connected with Rome. They had been conquered by the Romans, but they were not allowed to vote because of their loose connection. The other thing about allies is yes, they had to accept Roman rule, they had to accept Roman laws, but other than that, they were pretty much left to do whatever they wanted to do. As long as they didn't make any treaties with foreign countries um, or go against the Roman laws. Moving on. Rome eventually went to war against Carthage, which was a powerful city in North Africa. The struggle between them became known as the Punic Wars. And that is spelled P-U-N-I-C. The Punic Wars. And it lasted from 264 B.C. until 146 B.C., so about 120 years, give or take. Here's kind of a picture of the Punic Wars and some of the battles that occurred. We won't talk much into this. If you want to pause and take a look, feel free. But this talks about the different strategies that they used, the different routes they took in order to uh, try and conquer each other. Carthage was led by a brilliant general named Hannibal. Hannibal assembled an army of five, sorry, 50,000 infantry, which were just guys on foot, 9,000 cavalry, or soldiers on horseback, and 60 elephants. And they were intent on capturing Rome, 
They wanted Rome. He led his troops up through Spain and crossed the Alps into Italy. Now let's go back and put this into perspective. Here we have Carthage on the south here. And Hannibal, one of his techniques was not to go straight up the Mediterranean and into Rome, right here. Nope, he decided not to do that. Instead, he was going to do kind of a sneak attack. He was going to take his boats and go around and start in Spain. Here we start in Spain. He takes his troops with his elephants all the way up through Spain, takes a right turn at France into the Alps, which is a very, uh, the separation between Italy and the rest of Europe, basically, through the Alps, and then eventually back down, hoping to take Rome from the north. Eventually it failed, which we'll talk about in a minute. Here's an artist's depiction of them moving their troops through uh, the Alps uh, with their elephants. This is a very famous one, actually. Um, Trying to direct his troops through the Alps. Carthage was very successful at the strategy when they hooked around from the north. Uh, they initially had defeated the Romans, but the Romans were able to retreat, regroup, and prevent Hannibal from sacking Rome. In the end, Rome defeated Hannibal in 202 BC near Zuma. Rome eventually defeated Carthage in the Third Punic Wars, uh, thereby extending its power across the Mediterranean Sea. Once Rome was able to defeat Carthage, Rome had complete control of all the land surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. In that, he was able to completely control all of trade, all of shipping, thereby basically having the largest empire at the time. Uh, nobody could beat him because he had, his span of influence around the Mediterranean was so large. This is kind of a difficult map to see, but um, Rome's territory and power would only get bigger and stronger. So here we kind of see the power and the size of Rome and its empire. It's hard to see but if you think of all this white as water, all of that is the Mediterranean Sea. And there's the Black Sea right there. And everything in green was the Roman Empire. They controlled present-day Spain, which is right here. France, the Netherlands, right here. Eventually, they would control parts of Britannia all the way into Gaul and entire Italy. They've got Greece. They took over Turkey. Over here they had what would be present-day Israel and Lebanon. Down here we've got Carthage and all along the shoreline of the Mediterranean. The only part they didn't have at the time of this map was this section by Egypt, but eventually they would take that as well. So, that is the end of this particular lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact Mr. Vincent, and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. I hope you enjoy it, and have a great day.